So welcome to our uh, first of what I hope will become an annual event, uh, Virtual Service Managers Conference. Uh, I'm glad that you could make it uh, and be here today for this conference. Uh, we're going to talk uh, uh, this week, every day, about what the future holds for our industry and the things that dealers can do to uh, maximize uh, their probability of success. Uh, if, you, if you're watching on the, the app and you can uh, put your questions and comments in the uh, chat box there, uh, I, at the end of the program, I'll take a scan through them, try to make sure I answer everybody's questions. If you're watching on the replay, uh, just go ahead and email me at ken at kedmonds.biz, and then I can respond uh, via email to your questions. If, if you haven't registered for the conference, you're just watching off the, the viewing link, uh, please go ahead and register for the conference. Uh, plan on being here all week. For those of you that had, are meeting me for the first time, uh, my name is Ken Edmonds, and I have been in the industry about 30 years. Uh, my background, I started out owning a dealership, and so when you, when you own a small dealership, you sit in every seat in there. There's nothing that you don't know how to do. And then uh, after I sold my dealership, I did service management for a couple of dealers. Then I went to work for the manufacturer. And during that time, I got a chance to observe some of the very best operations and some that weren't the very best. And so I share that knowledge and the things that I learn. I also write for ENX Magazine uh, for Office Technology, collectively about uh, 50 articles that have been published. But enough about me. Let's talk about what the future is going to hold. So it's interesting that today we, th we face three threats that are very similar to uh, threats that existed in the past. And so we're going we're gonna to examine a little bit of history. We're going to look at uh, a cousin of our current industry, you could say. And we're going to go forward from there. So how many of you remember the things that we see sitting here on this desk? We have a camera with film. We have a typewriter, uh, paper files, and an old uh, wind-up alarm, alarm clock. And for those of you that have the same number of years I have in your life, uh, all of those things are familiar because those are the things that we used. But what we see today is that in general, with maybe the exception of paper files, those things are gone. I mean, they exist in museums and there are a few places where they have specific uses that you see them, but for the most part, they're gone. And dealers uh, back then that service typewriters, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna start with the typewriter industry. Because many of the companies that are and people that are in companies today are companies that came from or, or morphed from that industry. But there were a lot that didn't. And so those dealers uh, go back to, you know, about the time that HP, uh, two guys named Hewlett and Packard started working in a garage. You know, they may have thought that life was OK. You know, they looked at their sales and their sales were good. They were selling they were selling typewriters, you know, they were making money in the process. Sorry. And they may have thought the service revenue was good. And in reality, you know, they were looking at the metrics that they used in their industry and everything looked fine. But here's the challenge is that they were really looking at the white line down the road. In fact, I'll use the analogy, and we'll come back to it a couple of times during our discussion. It was like driving the car with the door open and staring at the white line. And the challenge with that is, is that things can be fine for a while doing that. You can look at that white line because that white line really represents where you are today where you are in your business and in your business current information. And we can look at those, and, and, and I'm not saying we don't want to look at them, but the challenge is, 
is, is that if we're looking at that white line and trying to drive, everything will be fine until it's not. And that's kind of what happened to typewriter dealers. They faced threats that they didn't recognize. And, and uh, I know a lot of uh, people that had typewriter dealer in their name that just went out of business because they didn't adapt and, and weren't prepared to change. And I guess that's really the key piece of it is, is that and this, this whole week is about preparation, trying to prepare your dealership, your business for what the future holds. Because if you're not prepared, the odds are really good that you're not going to succeed in the long term. So they were looking at the white line and they missed seeing the impact of several things. First one was a, there was a guy named Wang that invented word processing software. And they may have thought, oh, that's really expensive and there's no real use for it. Nobody's going to spend that money when they can just get a typewriter. You know, that's not a big deal. Then there was another little trend that kind of uh, probably snuck up on them. And that was the PC. Everybody thought that ha the idea of having a personal computer on everybody's desk was silly. Nobody thought that would happen. That just, I mean, it just wasn't on the horizon. And then there were the two guys I mentioned, Hewlett and Packard and the laser printer. But when we combined those three things together, they ended the typewriter industry, you know, in most aspects. You know, you look around your town today, and how many people do you know that sell and service typewriters? There are a few dealers in our industry that still do a little bit of typewriter service. I know a service manager, he's probably listening to me, that when I came in to see him every once in a while, he'd be working on a typewriter. But I don't think you'll find anybody that typewriters is their main line of business. That industry, to some extent, ceased to exist. And it was because of three threats that dealers that were looking at that white line on the road didn't see coming. You know, and so the key is, is that we as an industry and as individuals in this industry need to be looking out the windshield instead looking for what's looming on the horizon. And we're going to look at three threats in our industry today. I just happen to be a fan of the number three, I guess. But we're going to see how these three things pose a risk to your business and then what we can do about it. The first threat that we're going to look at is changing technology. Now, when we think about how our, you know, I, I can go back and uh, I can remember being a dealer and I was at a Toshiba conference for dealers where they demonstrated Microsoft at work, which was a good idea, but it never got adopted by the industry. But I was there and they showed a connected digital copier and printer. And that was the first digital copier and printer I'd ever seen. And they demonstrated it with a lot of other technology. There was a fax. And all of these devices used the interface of Microsoft at work. Now, that didn't catch on. But the digital copier caught on. The connected digital device that, that uh, most dealers now sell and use. You know, and we can look at, the, look at the slide up there. We look at the difference between the... Um, the telephone that people started with, and that's actually not what they started with, but you know, a, a, a more modern iteration to what we use and carry in our pocket today. Technology is changing. And that change in technology poses a threat to our current business model. And so we're going to talk about that threat. The first piece that we're going to talk about, clicked in the wrong spot there is inkjet printing. And it's interesting that it's becoming more prevalent. 
I just saw a news article this week that Epson in, unveiled three new models that are 50, 60, and a, or maybe 50, 70, and 100 page a minute devices that are targeted at the office environment. And, you know, a lot of times we think of inkjet technology. We go back to the old HP desk jet printer, you know, and the paper came out all wrinkled and soaked and it was, you know, it wasn't a threat. But it's becoming a threat. Uh, these new devices have booklet finishers on them, stapling, sorting, hole punching, pretty much anything that you can do with an existed connected device that uses toner, these Epson devices do. We look at all of the manufacturers, uh, they are high-end devices in the production in arena, now, at least for the, for the manufacturers that support real true production equipment, Konica, HP, Rico, they're high-end presses. What are they? They are all inkjet presses. Now, you know that it, it, if they can make a device that does 200 pages a minute and uh, – gets the copy quality that they need to replace a, you know, a conventional press that they can slow that process down and do it at a hundred pages a minute and 50 pages a minute. And in fact, we see some of the manufacturers are already doing that. The challenge with inkjet technology is, is that they don't require much in the way of service. Uh, I, I remember the first time when I was uh, visiting uh, one of the BTA shows, I saw the Epson, the initial Epson 100 page a minute. And I was talking to the, the rep there about the service. And he said, oh, you change the feed tires every uh, 200,000 pages. And I'm like, that's all the maintenance? He said, yeah, that's all the maintenance. And, and my initial thought was, is how do you sell a cost per copy agreement on that? And I asked him about it, and he says, well, we're going to protect the ink. The ink's only going to be available to the dealers that buy the equipment. Uh, I'm going to suggest that in time that ink's going to be widely available. And it becomes very difficult then to hold on to your base if they can print on an inkjet device and they don't need to have a service contract. You know, if what they have is user serviceable, you know, and that Epson 100 page a minute, the feed tires were, by the way, user serviceable, you know, it becomes really hard to justify the, um, you know, the cost and, you know, and the revenue stream that we need as dealers need to get from the devices we have in the field. And the reason I say that the ink's gonna be widely available, even for non-dealers, is because when I started in this business, I used to go out and sell toner for every model device that existed because I could buy it. I could get OEM toner and I could do it at a point where I could sell it cheaper than the dealer. In fact, I tell people I'm the reason that cost per copy came into existence because it was myself and people that were in business like I was that were selling supplies and undercutting the dealer's uh, supply sales. And I see it's going back in that direction with inkjet. That's my concern. No proof, but like I said, the, the challenge that exists usually is you got a dealer that's got to buy X number of, of units of toner to make quota and get all the rebates, but they don't need that many units of toner. So if they buy it to get the rebates, what are they going to do? It's going to go into the wholesale market. They'll skate it sideways. And, you know, that happened with Xerox. It happened with everybody's toner was available in, as in the aftermarket. So that's, that is a threat. That's something that uh, is of concern to, it should be of concern to dealers in general, is the changes in technology as they come. Now, as we're going to go through and we're going to talk about these different changes and the different things that are looming on the horizon. They're not here yet. But if we're looking out the windshield, we can start to see the outline of these things coming down the road at us. And I'm going to share in this presentation, I'm going to share one simple, well, I won't say simple. The concept is simple. The process may be a little not as simple. But one way that you can defend against all of these uh, challenges. 
And as I said, it's nothing I'm selling. How about this? Uh, for those of you, again, <laughs> of my generation and you know, maybe the generation or two after me, I remember that Pac-Man. You had this little man that you went around and you tried to gobble up all the little dots. And you can think of that as uh, Dex or Flex Technologies or um, Novatech or Marco or Pacific Office Automation, companies like that. And if they're, well, let's just put it this way. If you have a Staples in town, Dex is in town. These companies are going to be in your market eventually. And again, you can maybe just see the shape of them on the horizon, but expect them to be in your town one way or the other. And so the question is going to be is, is how do you deal with them? And it, I'm not saying that they're going to eat up your company, but they do pose a threat to you. So, for example, they buy dealers. And the prospect is, is that you may not be for sale, but what about your competition? Might they be for sale? I mentioned staples, you know, because they if you have staples, you've got decks. And the challenge that they pose is not just like I said, the, the buying and the and the straight up and down the street top of your sales. That's not why they're a threat. They're a threat because they offer such a wide variety of, of services. You know, and, and I go back with Marco. I used to support them when I worked for uh, for Sharp. That's uh, 18, almost 19 years ago now. And one of the things that was interesting about Marco, even at that point in time, they had a lot of other lines. They did a lot of other things. But they were fairly small. I won't say they were my one my largest dealer, but they weren't anywhere near what they are today. And they they had uh, like five branches, but at that point in time, they were the largest cabling installer in the state of Minnesota. And that um, presence shaped their future. And so they offer things like voice over IP phones. Network support in simplified billing. Click the button there. And so the collection of these things gives them a threat to penetrate your current clients, even if they don't go in after the copier service. Your customer might love you to death. But what happens when Dex does the phones and thus Dex does the network support? or Marco, or, or Pacific Office Automation, whoever it is that's, that's the current player in your market. Understand they're coming after your business. They may not be coming after your company, but they are eventually coming after your business. You know, and again, so that's our second threat that we've talked about. Let's look at our next one. Declining print volume. That is a huge issue. Um, you know, in the, this current, the, the, the impact of the pandemic has been uh, unexpected. And one of the things that, that I, I will tell you, there are things that, that some dealers did that protected them much better than most. We're gonna, and we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about all of these things more during this week. But declining uh, print volume is really kind of a, a double-edged sword because a couple of things are happening. Cu customers are printing less. And, not, and, and I mean, the, the COVID environment really knocked printing down. Everybody that, you know, that does prognostation, prog everybody that makes forecasts, there we go, I'll use a, a less expensive word there. Everybody that, that does forecasts shows that print revenue and print impressions are declining in the office environment. The, the areas of growth they see, and, and, and one of them is one we've already talked about is inkjet. There are more pages moving from toner-based devices to inkjet all of the time, and that's an area where there's some growth. The production environment 
And, and that's pr primarily, again, we're primarily in an inkjet world there. But that environment, prints are increasing. But pretty much everywhere else throughout the, the environment, they show pages counts going down. And that's the projection for the foreseeable future. They don't see that. There's not like there's some bright spot on the horizon. I looked at, uh, in researching this part, I looked at, at graphs from several of the industry experts. And they all showed this dip, you know, for right now. And then they show it coming back up, but never to where it was. And then it starts to dry and go down again. So we have print, uh, print volume is declining. Here's the other piece of it, and this is what makes it a truly a double-edged sword. I can remember when I used to get a penny for for a non-connected black and white copier. Any of you think you could get that today? I know the answer is no, because it's just not possible. That's not the world that we live in. And so as a result of that, we have our print volume going down and we have our click price going down and those effects become compound you know and this isn't exact math but you think about it if our number of clicks goes down percent 10 percent and we sell those uh, 10 percent fewer clicks for 10 percent less money our revenue has gone down 20 percent and that's not a healthy environment to be operating in so we need to find something that can fix that as well. And I'm going to share with you a quote that I really like. Um, and this was from Lao Tzu. He said, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you're heading. And, you know, we can apply that to our industry today. Because right now, if the way that most dealers are going is they're going into a path that's leading to declining revenue. And it can only de decline so far before the doors close. And, and so it becomes really important that we start to think about how we're going to change direction. And it's interesting. Here's a quote uh, from Gap Intelligence that I, I, I read this week in doing some research. And it was talking about the impact of, of COVID, but it implies in general. It said the dealers that have a lifeline need to adapt now to survive and grow in the future. You know, as I said, need to adapt now, not next week, not next month. We need to adapt now. In the, in the last sentence there, they said they need to pivot from their traditional revenue streams. We've got to look for other ways to bring money in. You know, it, it's just that simple. Is we've got to find some things to do that will make a difference. And so now we'll look at a different quote. This one's from Sun Tzu. And he made this statement, and, and I like that, and it applies a lot to what we're talking about. He said that every battle is won before it is fought. And the point he was making is, is that it is the preparation and the planning that enables people to win in battle. You can't go into a battle without some kind of preparation and expect to win. You know, get 50 untrained soldiers and show up on the battlefield and hope the enemy's in as bad a shape as you are. But it, it comes from developing a plan and putting together all the pieces of that plan to win. And so that's what, you know, that's what this week's about, is, is about figuring out what our plan is for the future. And then how do we get prepared for and ready for it? What are the things that we can start doing today to get us to where we need to be tomorrow? Hope this is making sense. Oh, so I kind of got, I kind of get ahead of my slides. I'm sorry, but it, you know, the preparation is what makes a difference. And, 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 and we'll go back to my analogy. We've got to, I'm not saying that we don't still pay attention to metrics. You know, people that know me know I'm a firm believer in the value of metrics. I don't think there's ever been a business that can be managed as easily by looking at the numbers and, you know, in particular in service. 
You know, I, I'm huge on those metrics and what they mean and how they can benefit dealers. But what I will say is that we can't look just at the white line. We need to start looking at the horizon and start to identify it. And there are going to be things that will show up after the things that I mentioned here. You know, there'll be things that are kind of way out there in the fog and the distance that we can't see yet that's coming. But we need to be looking for them. We need to be paying attention to them. And as soon as we can start to see what they look like, we need to start to, to, to plan and prepare for it. So I'm going to give you some a suggestion this is my one, my one plan. Sorry, get caught up over here. You know, again, we I mentioned that focus on the future, and I like the the analogy here of skeet shooting. <laughs> uh, we'll come to the one plan in just a second because you know I'm not a big shooter. But the one thing I do know about shoot, shooting ski is that you don't aim at where the target is right now. You aim at where the target's going to be at some point in time. You know, when you think the shot's going to get to a spot, you want that spot to be where the ski gets to it at the same time. So that's what we need to, when I, when I say we need to focus on the future, is we need to be looking out and thinking about that trajectory of where things are headed and make our plans to intersect different pieces of it at the right time. We can't wait to pull the trigger till it gets to that spot because, you know, that shot's going to pass way behind that clay pigeon. So we think about it. What is the market? Yep. I'm looking at the slides in, in entirety and not clicking. I apologize there. So what's your market going to look like in five to 10 years? And, and if you're not thinking about that, I would encourage you to start thinking and planning for it. Figure out where this industry is going to be five years from now and figure out how do you get to be ready for that point. We're going to look now at one tactic. And this one tactic will defeat all three of those threats I mentioned. I won't say it's 100% successful, but it's the tool that you really need to put in your toolkit to, uh, to be able to go out there and, and to defend against them, to be able to uh, prevent all three of those things from destroying your business. What's that tactic? You need to own the customer. You, the customer needs to become yours. And we're going to talk, we'll look at some slides. I've got a few things we'll look at here about that. In a lot of cases, this is the situation today. In your customer's office, there's somebody that takes care of the network and maybe the displays. There's probably a phone provider. You know, and collectively, all of you are taking care of the customer's technology. But for you, this should be a really uncomfortable situation. And why should it be uncomfortable? Let's just think about this as the next step. What happens when uh, the person that's taking care of the other technology and the network decides to take care of the phone system? Where do you sit? If we think about it, you're really sitting on the outside of that situation looking in. You may still have business there, but how easy is it for this to happen? Oh. Well, I'll come back to it. Actually, let me, this to happen. That's what I wanted you to see was that. Now we're gonna go back a slide. Uh, you know, and if you don't think that that's a possibility, it is. In fact, um, I, I love this uh, comment. Well, I won't say I love it, but I, I think this comment illustrates the point exactly. Uh, this was Eric McCann of Lexmark, and he, this was during a, a end of the day with Ray a segment. 
he made the statement. He said the new capabilities in managing print fleets provide the new reality for IT services providers to vendor manage print. It sounds a whole lot to me like IT services people are being encouraged to come after your base. And they should be. I mean, it's easy revenue. I won't say it's easy revenue, but it's revenue that could be had. And we go back to this slide. If they own the network, it's pretty easy for them to bump you out. And what happens once this situation where you've got a provider in, and Marco is a perfect example of this, a provider that does all of the technologies. In fact, Marco's, um, and this started years back, but Marco's premise was that if it touched a Cat5 or a Cat6 cable, that Marco wanted to own it, wanted to support it, they wanted to sell it. And the results are as they've turned into a Pac-Man that's, that's eating dealers everywhere. I saw a couple of years back, I saw a news article in one of the trade journals where Marco had taken over as the IT department of a hospital. Who's ever going to sell that hospital any kind of technology except Marco? So that's why, and it's not just Marco. Like I said it's Dex, it's Novatech, it's you know, it's all of the major players run their business along this model. This is why they are such a threat to you because they don't have to come in and displace you initially as the uh, you know the copier dealer. Like, you know, the, the the output device provider. They don't have to do that. All they've got to do is get their foot in the door and get a hold of the network. And at that point in time, your days are numbered. And it might not be that it's just the major companies outside. What if your competitors started offering a complete suite? And they came in and uh, think about, imagine this. I'll give you a scenario to picture in your mind. Think of your most capable competitor managing the networks of your current clients. And how does that feel? You know, imagine walking in to your best client and you find your competitors in there servicing their networks. What's that feel like? I can't imagine it feels very good, but that's the possibility that exists. That is the possibility that you need to be concerned about. So let's look at a different future. Let's look at a future where you go in and you partner up with somebody and you get the network. And once you own the network, guess what happens? you become much harder to displace because a current competitor that doesn't manage their network is not going to be very capable and very e it's not going to be easy to get them in to replace the copiers when you've got the network. When, you know, there's a lot of truth in whoever controls the network controls the world. And so if once you have that network technology you, and once you manage the cluster, your customer's network, the, the other piece of it is you become very hard to displace even if somebody else does it because nobody wants to change network providers. So now you're starting to get a, a you know a, a, a hold on that customer. And I like to think of it, you could think of it, uh, for those of you that are fishermen, if you have the imaging technology and that's all you have, it's kind of like you're fly fishing with a barbless hook. You know, and, and, and that hook may be in, but there's nothing to keep it from coming out. You get the network, as it's something that you have control over. Now, all of a sudden, you could think of yourself as a cat fisherman that's got a treble hook with, uh, with some big barbs. And when that hook's set, the odds of that fish coming off become very small. And that's what happens once you start to own the network. The other thing that, that we get is eventually you can get to this. 
And at this stage, you own that customer. They're yours. It doesn't care if it doesn't matter if Marco comes in the door, because the challenge of unseating you becomes really, really difficult. And I'm not just picking on Marco, that's just the name that pops into my brain when I think about this. But it becomes very difficult to remove you if you own everything in that customer. You literally, truly own the customer. And I'm not talking about doing this in a way that is bad for the customer. You know, not talking about being that way with them. You want to give them great service. Because if you're not giving them great service, then you become less secure. That, that you haven't really set the hook. But if you take care of their network, you can take care of all their technology. And you provide them great service, that treble hooks, uh, got all three hooks embedded in that in the jaw of that catfish, and he's yours. You can't go anywhere. Just to wear the analogy out. And some more from Sun Tzu. I, I like this one as well. He said, those who are victorious plan effectively and change decisively. They are like a great river that maintains its course but adjusts its flow. You know, and so the key part of this is to plan effectively and change decisively. Some of the things that we're talking about are not things that you can stick your toe in. They are things you can plan for and prepare for. But once you start to roll them out, you want to be committed to that course. So we're going to talk about the three pieces of, the, of what it takes to plan to win. And talk, we're talking about tr planning, training, and execution. And I thought this execution piece was really interesting. Um, for those of you that were at the Orlando um, convention, I can't remember. It might have, yeah, I guess it was the national meeting a year, not this year, but the last previous year in Orlando. He was our keynote speaker there, or I say ours. He was the, the BTA's keynote speaker there. And he talked about the difference between special forces troops and the regular, he was talking about army. He said you could think of it, and, you know, the, the, the regular army trains to do things at the high school level. And they train to do the same things that special forces do. They march, they, they survive, they train to do battle, they train to shoot. They do all of those things to the high school level. He said the difference with the special forces is they train to do it at the PhD level. You know, and so you think about what he was saying and you think about the, what that meant to the training regimen and the amount of time and energy and effort and investment that they made in training. The difference was huge. But the results showed the value of that preparation and that training. And so that's what we're going to talk about is planning and training. You know, and again, we think about special forces. There's not a special force ops where everybody just strolls out on the battlefield and say, hey, you guys feel like fighting today? You know, if the special forces are going out there to do battle, they're going to have a very strict, very specific game plan where every member of that team knows exactly what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And by doing that, they have a high rate of success. For those of you that don't know who he was, he was uh, the main character in the movie Black Hawk Down, except he was there in real life. So we'll start with uh, changing what and how you sell. And so you and let's, we'll talk about a couple of things here. First of all, which is easier to use to compete? A uh, equipment lease and a CPC agreement where your client shows that to the next vendor that walks in the door and the vendor after that. And what happens? Your CPC rate goes down, 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 down. Which is why our print margins are declining. It's why our print revenue is declining because we keep uh, at least feeling like we have to give away the service. How about this instead? We're going to sell you a monthly plan. It covers all of your technology and you pay us X number of dollars a month per 
user. Now, how is your competitor going to be able to go in and, and offer a lower click rate? So once you can support everything in the client's office, at that point in time, you now can present information and make your conversation with the customer about taking care of their technology and taking that burden off of them. And you can bundle all of those things together in a price that lets you restore your profit margin in service, or restore your profit margin in equipment, and provide, still provide good value to your customer. Because again, this is never, any of this is about not providing good value to the customer. But what happens is, is now what we, we can think of our offer as like an onion with lots of layers to it. And the competitor can't see down to the inside of that onion to see how it's structured and see what the core piece of what they want to bid. Plus, if they're only selling copiers and you're selling solutions to all your customers' needs, oh, which do your customers like better, do you think? Which makes their life simpler. So that's what I'm encouraging is, is that, that you create the path to get to a point where you can support their technology. You do it on a monthly basis. And by doing that, you now uh, become pretty much invincible on the sales side and you become the customer that, that takes you up on that now becomes your customer. And let's back up a little bit. I'm going to look at a couple slides back here. So let's imagine that this is you in the pink. Somebody else right now has the copier technology. And you have the network and the telephones and other technology. So rather than going in and trying to displace the copier guy, you go in and get the other stuff first. And then this is you. You've changed from pink, from green to pink. And you own it all. So that's one of the other tools. Get back to where I was here. That's one of the tools that you have is now that you don't have to sell. You don't have to go in. Let's say that you have a competitor in there and they've got a good relationship. You don't have to fight against that relationship. You can go in and try to pick up the other pieces of it first. And once you're in the door and once they're your customer as well, and once you, if you get to the point that you own the network, you know, uh, that competitor that does just the copiers, you can make them go away. And you can become the Pac-Man that's running around eating up your competition's clients. There's some steps involved in getting there, though. Sorry. Get caught up on slides. So what we need to do is we need to figure out where you are today. What's your situation like? And this assessment looks at several needs to look at several things. And you need to just sit down and start thinking about, okay, where am I? What can I do? And we're gonna, we'll talk about it. So your ERP system, does it support different billing models? Are you in a situation where you can only bill in, in you know, the basically copier-based billing? Because things are going to change if you own the customer. So that's a piece of it to think about. The next piece of it is what are you doing in-house? Are you know, and I would ask you this question, are you still filing papers in cabinets? I, I remember you know having a conversation with a service manager. And again, he's probably here here. He may not remember the conversation, but I think he's in the audience today. But we were standing in the shop. And the office manager came out and climbed up on top of uh, the area that was like over the administration and started digging through boxes of papers looking for something. And I looked at the service manager and I said, don't you guys sell document management? And he said, yeah. And I just looked back up there and said, hmm. But the, the question is, is are you, are you implementing the things that you want your customers to implement? There's nothing that will make you more powerful than be able to tell your story of how doing the things that you suggest have made your company better. And for those of you that deal on the sales side of the house, you know that there's nothing, you know, facts tell, but stories sell. 
And so your story of how you changed your business model to use technology and the impact it had can be a powerful testimonial of why your customer might want to do that. But if you're out there saying, hey, you need to go to document management and you're not on document, well, what, what, what are you guys using? How are you doing it? How's it help? Oh, we haven't implemented it yet. Tell me how that sales went. So, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer. Start doing these things in-house. And you want to make a skills inventory of your company. Where are you right now? How good are you at selling solutions? How good are you at supporting solutions? You know, if you're not good at selling and supporting, those are things that are going to need training. How good are you at supporting networks? Do you do your in-house networking? Or does your partner who you would use to do managed services take care of your network? Again, you need to be on the same platform that you're trying to talk to your customers about. You need to be, you know, helping your customers understand, you know, that you're using that and it's been good and you can tell them your story of how it made your company better. The next question is, is who do you have that you can train in these areas? So, from, for example, if you're still a small company and you're going to need to get some more skill in some of these areas, you know, the, the people that you're, that, the, your young, let's call them your young guns, you know, they probably came out of a computer skill set that, that, you, that your existing technicians and existing salespeople may not have. So look to see who do you have that you can train. Then we got to determine what you need after we after we know what you have or after you know what you have you can start to look at what is it that I need and who do I have that might be trainable and then what are we going to have to fill from the outside in other words you know if we go through and we look at, at the inventory or if you go through and look at the inventory of your team and say hey we've got these people and they've got these skills but we need this skill and this skill and we've got some slots we're going to hire for. Well, let's hire to fill those slots. We're going to tailor this a little bit, and I'm going to kind of step through this pretty quickly on service because a lot of these things are going to touch your service department. And this is for your – and your service manager needs to be a part of the planning process. Uh, you know, I see too often, and in, in not trying to step on toes, but I see too often that in, in companies that the service manager is somewhat of a mushroom. People keep him in the dark and they feed him stuff. You know, and he needs to be a part of this plan. He needs to be a part of the process as you start looking out there, figuring out how you're going to go forward. He's got to identify his current capabilities, the training he needs. His new hires need to be based on where you see the company going in the future. And, and just to put it in perspective, and we talk about this in the service training that I provide through the BTA, but it takes about three years from the time you hire a technician till he's where you need him to be. And if our business is going to change significantly in, in, through the, in the next three years, then the people that we hire today need to be the people we need for three years from now. You know, it goes back to that thought of skeet shooting. We need to be aiming for the future, not aiming for today. We need to look at it and start working at it and thinking about our processes and procedures. And even if they work good for today, we need to think again about where are they going to, where do they need to be in the future? What is it where it's going to change? How are we going to change what we do? How do we start preparing now? for three years from now, because that's, again, we need to start in that direction. Uh, it was interesting, uh, this point about leveraging technology, and I forget the economist's name. I knew it for a long time, and you get old, you forget stuff like this. But it was interesting because when I first started my business, I was doing a lot of study on business and starting my dealership. And, and he made the statement, he said that in times past, that wealth was defined by the resources that a company, you know, I'm talking about resources, talking about the materials, peoples, all those things that a company had or a country had. 
And he said the, in the modern day, though, that's changed, that the real definition of wealth is the resources a company or a country has leveraged by the technology they use. And, and the reason he said that is he said, look at Japan. That's a country that doesn't have that many people. It's a country that doesn't have much in the way of natural resources, but it is a dominant player in the world economy. Why? It's because they leverage the way out of technology. And so, again, you think about your company. Are you leveraging technology? Are you trying to stay state of the art? Or are we staying in state of the yesterday? Because all of these things are things that need to go into our plan and into our thought process so that we're geared up and ready to go. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that one. Last piece of it was to execute at the PhD level. And when I say execute at the PhD level, again, I'm talking about being the very, very, very best we can be. There's a, a song, I think it's Tina Turner, but in one of the lines goes, better than all the rest. And I'm sure that you try now to be better than all the rest. But maybe our soldiers are still just high school level and we need to get them to the PhD level. That involves, and this involves everybody in the company getting the training they need and the skill sets they need to compete in the future. Again, this whole presentation has been about competing in the future, not competing today. Um, talking about, I got one more uh, saying for you that I like. Said so the an entrepreneur always searches for change, responds to it, and exploits it as an opportunity. Everything is going to change. Life happens. Things change. The question is, are you going to be caught by it or are you going to exploit it? So this week, Tomorrow, we've got Wes McCarter on changing what you sell and, and looking at billing models. And it's really interesting that dealers that went to a seat-based billing concept, their revenue stream stayed the same during the pandemic because they weren't click-based. And if you want an interesting exercise, go back and think about what, would, what your company, what kind of shape your company would be in today if you'd been able to collect for all the clicks that your customers normally used. Do the math on it, make it an exercise, and then think about it because that's what click-based billing or seat-based billing did. And Wes is gonna talk about devices of service, but that's what it did for customers that were on a flat rate billing program. Their revenue didn't go down. When, on Wednesday, we've got uh, Felipe Godoy. He's going to talk about adding telecom to the mix. And again, it's not a sales presentation for his company, but he's going to talk about the process of adding telecom to it and how that become, can then become a weapon in your tool bag and a tool that you can use to uh, get your way in the door. Because again, all of this is going to be about getting your foot in the door with your competitor's clients so that you can start to own them. And again, that needs to be your attitude is you're going to go out there and own them. On Thursday, oh, I'm sorry, not clicking. Uh, John Schweitzer, he's going to talk to you about uh, adding managed network services to your product mix and why the, using a partner matters. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting. I was talking to Ed McLaughlin. Uh, he related a conversation he'd had um, with a major company that, that's well known in their, for their networking capabilities. And the president of that company said if they'd known what it was going to cost to build out their knock and train everybody, he said they would have found a partner instead of doing it themselves. So rather than trying to build it out, what you need to do is partner with somebody. Now, like I said, none of these are sales presentations, but they are going to illustrate the process of things that you can do to start to own your customer. And then Friday, uh, uh, Jack Duncan, for those of you that don't know him, he's a 
industry expert. He's been around forever in the in the managing service and training on service. And he's going to talk about metrics and how there are changes you can make in, in what you measure and, and setting new goals and new, new um, focusing on perhaps different metrics than you're looking at can improve your current profitability and free up revenue to drive your future growth. I appreciate your time. Let me, I'm going to change my views here for just a second and we'll see what we had in the way of comments and questions. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you guys you had to, you had to hit the play button. I apologize for that. Um, somebody posted it in the chat. Okay. So I didn't see any questions. I, I appreciate everybody's uh, time and attention. Hopefully I provided information that will help. And um, like I said, uh, tomorrow, uh, Wes is going to do a great job. Uh, you'll have the same opportunity, and you will have to press play. And I'll, I'll put up a sign that says that uh, so that it starts to play. I, I really apologize for those of you that missed that. And I'm, uh, I wasn't where I could watch. Tomorrow I'll be watching the chat window. I couldn't, couldn't watch the chat, watch the slides, and talk at the same time. I'm I am a one-man show, and I'm just not that multifaceted. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. We'll talk to you um, tomorrow. Yeah. Uh...